My name is Tammy Austin and I'm going to be giving a book talk today. The first book that I want to present is called At Home in Mitford by Jan Karen. He left the coffee-scented warmth of the Main Street Grill and stood for a moment under the green awning. The honest cold of an early mountain spring made him remember that he enjoys all the minor differences when he passes through a room. He passes through a door and then there's different smells and different attractions. It helps him to be aware of all these things and he likes to exhort his congregation to do the same. Right now he's headed toward his office building which is two blocks away and he is delighted to discover that he isn't walking at all. He's ambling. You just met Father Tim. He's a gentle kind soul and he is the father of the Episcopalian Church in Mitford, North Carolina. He's been a devoted father of the congregation for 12 years and a devoted bachelor. But change is in the crisp spring air. There's a large homeless dog that only responds to Bible verses. There's a lonely, unloved, but lovable teenage boy and an appealing new neighbor named Cynthia. To find out more about Father Tim, read At Home in Mitford by Jan Carey. My next book is called One Child by Tori Hayden. I should have known. I read the article about the six-year-old girl who abducted a three-year-old neighbor boy, tied him to the tree, and burned him. I should have known. My name is Tori Hayden, and I'm a special needs teacher. I get the children that are left over. I have the eight children that are physically handicapped, emotionally disturbed, mentally handicapped, or learning disabled. And I should have known that Sheila would come into my classroom. No other teacher would have wanted her, and none of the parents would have wanted their children to be in the same class with Sheila. Well, Sheila was just a little tiny thing. She had matted hair, hostile eyes, and a bad smell. The record said that she lived with her father in a tiny shack that didn't have any heat, plumbing, or electricity. When she was four years old, she was abandoned on the side of the highway by her mother. Her father had spent most of Sheila's young life in prison, but she was still released to his custody once her mother abandoned her. The county says she had chronic maladjustment to childhood, and the test battery showed that she was untestable. She wouldn't answer any of the questions. I knew that Sheila would be a hard child to love because she worked at being unlovable, and I knew she would be hard to reach, but I hoped that she wasn't unreachable. It is actually a wonderful book of hope and promise. And it's called One Child by Tori Hayden. And it is true. True story. Okay, my next one is called Rebecca by Daphne de Maurier. During a summer in Monte Carlo, a simple girl without a family and without a name made a living as a hired companion for a rather classless American lady. Also vacationing in Monte Carlo at the same time was Max de Winter. He was a very wealthy um, Englishman who had just lost his beloved wife in a very public boating accident. The companion, being very shy, didn't make her presence known on their first encounter, but soon she finds herself alone with Max, and her innocence captures his heart, and he asks her to marry him. She agrees, and soon she finds herself as the mistress of Manderley, which is his, inf his beautiful estate in England. When she first moves there, she relies heavily on the help at Manderley Estates to help her know what she needs to be doing. And all of them are very obliging, except for Mrs. Danvers. And she has a palpable and unabashed disdain for the new Mrs. De Winter. Finally, Mrs. De Winter is able to convince Max that they should host a fancy dance party, which is what they used to be famous for. And Mrs. De Winter finds unexpected aid in Mrs. Danvers as she plans her costume for that night but Mrs. Danvers has nefarious motives. Well, Mrs. the new Mrs. De Winter's costume causes a lot of problems. It embarrasses her, it upsets Max, and it opens up new old wounds and unleashes ghosts of the Mandalay estate. Piece by piece, Rebecca is able to find the truth about the mysterious death of Rebecca and comprehend the kind of woman she really was and the hold that she has over Mrs. Danvers, Max, and the Mandalay estate itself. Find out more, read Rebecca by Daphne de Maurier. Okay, my next one is called Sarah's Key by Tatiana de Rosne. You may have heard about Anne Frank. 
and Elie Wies, Wies, Wiesel, but some stories about World War II are not as well known. And this is a story that takes place in France in 1942. Sarah was awakened in the middle of the night by pounding on the door. It was the policeman. At first she was worried, but then she heard that the policeman was speaking French, which was her native tongue, so she knew that she would be safe. However, she was mistaken. They had come for her and her family. Sarah's mother was given a few minutes to pack a few of their belongings. While Sarah's mother is sobbing and packing, Sarah goes to find her brother. Her brother refuses to get ready. Instead, he hides in the cupboard where they play. In the cupboard, they have toys and pillows and blankets, some books, a flashlight, and even a water bottle. Sarah asks her brother if he's afraid. He says, no, lock me in, I'll be safe. So Sarah locks him in, and she knows she'll be able to get him out that afternoon when they return. She slips the key in her pocket, and Sarah and her mother leave the apartment, never to return. To find out more about Sarah and her family, read Sarah's Key by Tatiana de Rosemary. <laughs> okay, my next one is called Stiff by Mary Roach, and it is nonfiction. The way I see it, being dead is not terribly far off from being on a cruise ship. You're lying on your back, your brain is shut down, your heart begins to soften, nothing new happens, and nothing is expected of you. However, if I were to go on a cruise, I would prefer to go on a research cruise. This is where passengers still don't have a lot expected of them, but they get to help a scientist out with their research project. They get to go to unknown, unimagined places, and they get to do things that they wouldn't otherwise get to do. I guess I feel the same way about being a corpse. Why lie around? Any surgical procedure that's been developed over the last thousands of years, cadavers have been around to help. In fact, they've been around making history. For the last 2,000 years, cadavers, some of them unwilling and some of them unwittingly, have been involved in scientists' boldest strides and weirdest undertakings. They helped when France developed the first guillotine, which was the humane approach to hanging. They were there with linen, helping with, learn more about embalming. They were there at congressional hearings on paper to help make the case for mandatory seatbelts. They've been on the space shuttle Okay, pieces of them have been on the space shuttle. And they helped a graduate student in Tennessee debunk spontaneous human combustion. However, a cadaver cannot have these adventures until they are no longer a person. A person cannot be a cadaver. But once you become a cadaver, the possibilities are endless. You can help the military, you can go to medical school, you can help serve murder mysteries, or you can just become worm food. Death doesn't have to be boring. So, read Stiff by Mary Roach to learn about all your possibilities as a cadaver. This is a true uh, work of art, <laughs> and it's very funny, but please don't read it while you're eating. It just doesn't work. So, and she's written a lot, and I really like her style. It's kind of that understated dry wit. Okay, my next book is The Shape of Mercy by Saren Mesner. Leaving a life of privilege to strike out on her own, Lauren Dunro chooses to go to a state college over Stanford, and she chooses to earn her own income over the ample monthly allowance that she could be allowed. She gets a part-time job working for 83-year-old Abigail Boyles, who wants her to transcribe journal entries of her ancestor named Mercy Hayworth, who was a victim of the Salem witch trials. Almost immediately, Lauren is drawn into the drawn into the life of Mercy, who died four centuries ago. As the fervor of the witch trials increases and the accusations that fly around Mercy, Mercy is trapped in the grip of chaos and fear and trying to overcome the influence of petty revenge and superstition. What Lauren finds is the secrets of the journey of the journal actually extend to Abigail, the librarian, who is mysterious and embittered as well. With a growing strength, Lauren finds herself drawn to Mercy and her life, and she makes Lauren take a startling new look at her life, her relationships around her, and who she really is and what she believes in. To learn more about these three amazing women, Lauren, Abigail, and Mercy, read The Shape of Mercy by Sarah Mesner. Okay, I have two more. My next one is a nice little lighthearted read. It's called Abby Cooper. Psychic Guy by Victoria Laurie. 
ever since Abby was a little girl, she could see things. Not scary or evil, she just kind of always knew what was coming next. In fact, she knew about the fire in their basement one week before it happened. She knew about her grandfather's death ten minutes before the phone call came. And to her parents' chagrin, she knew that her father's job would be downsized a month before he received his pink slip. Because Abby's parents don't believe in the metaphysical, they thought that all of her acts of divining were actually causing the problems and that she was forcing them to happen. So Abby learned to keep her mouth shut. During Abby's college years and her early career in banking, if any inspiration came, she tried to distract herself, think of something else, and start, start humming. So by the time Abby was 26, she was humming all the time. But Abby wanted to help people with these gifts. So she took a leap of faith and opened up a business as a psychic eye. But then one of her clients ends up dead, and all the clues start pointing to her because she knows too many details about the murder. So will Abby be able to use her psychic power to solve the mystery? Will her psychic powers help her or hurt her? To find out more, read Abby Cooper's Psychic Eye by Victoria Laurie. All right, and my last one is called Daughter of the Forest. And this is one of my favorite books of all time. And it's by Juliette Marillier. Lady Sorka was the seventh child and only... The lovely Sorka was the seventh child and only daughter of Lord Colum of Seven Waters. Bereft of a mother, she was comforted by her six brothers. They wa Sorka was the light of their lives, and they wanted her only to know contentment. But Sorka's joy was shattered when her father remarried and was bewitched by his new wife. She was an evil enchantress, and she bound her Sorka's brothers with a terrible smell, a spell that only Sorka could lift. And the only way she could lift this spell was by staying silent. If she breaks her silence before she completes the quest that the fair folk give her, she will lose her brothers forever. But then Sorka is kidnapped by enemies of Seven Water and taken to a foreign land. And there, she's torn between the desire to save her brothers and a love that comes only once. Sorka despairs, but the magic of the fair folk knows no boundaries, and love is the strongest magic of all. To learn about Sorka, and her brothers read The Daughter of the Forest by Juliet Marinella. Okay, that's all I have.